Good morning. How are you feeling? Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 There are some of you here this morning that have never experienced what we're going to do this morning. Wait a minute. I've been a great fan of what I call a sermon and song. I've been singing a lot more than I've preached in my life. What we're going to do this morning is sort of weave those two things together. Ryan is not here. He's uh, down uh, at the Desert Sands today. Uh, we give him the fifth Sundays off. And so I will be both leading our singing and hopefully bringing some thoughts to mind that will help us. I really enjoyed putting this one together, and I hope that you enjoy it as much as, as I did. And, uh, as always, when you do something like this, you always wonder, is your point going to get made? And I hope that you see what the point is and that you can take something in a way that will encourage you and benefit you. I'm going to try not to do a lot of talking. We're going to read a few scriptures. A lot of them are just one or two verses. And you have to trust me, I've tried very hard not to take them out of context, but sometimes just that specific verse says what I want to say. And then a lot of what we're going to learn, I want you to pay close attention to the words of the songs that we sing, as well as singing. So as we begin, oh, I guess it would help if I turn the television on. And yeah, I think that's what I was looking forward to. Forgot yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's why I'm saying it's not changing. All right, go on, TV, wake up. Technology, ain't it great? And I just demonstrated one of the biggest problems in technology that none of them work <laughs> when it's operator here. All right. This one may seem a little depressing, but it, trust me, it does make a point. Now, an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, right there, that's going to be a problem in their future. Right now, this is coming out of Egypt, and there was marriage in between the Israelites and the Egyptians. We don't know that except for finding it out from Leviticus went out among the people of Israel. An Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name. And that would be the name of God. They've got the Ten Commandments now. That's a problem. So they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shelameth, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him into custody until the will of the Lord should be made clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. Wow. <coughs> and speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name shall be put to death. God takes his name seriously. And did you see the guy was what we would call a half-breed? He was half Egyptian, half Israelite. And God said, it doesn't matter. Whoever is part of your congregation is not to do this. So I'll say it again. Wow. This is serious stuff. God is very serious about his name. Thank goodness there's no more stoning. <laughs> Either ourselves in, in our lives or somebody we know might have committed this problem. And so when you think about it in society, God, that's the name you most commonly think of as God. You ever heard anybody say, oh my God? Well, if it's said in the right context, if it's meant from an honest, sincere heart, it may be okay. But unfortunately, it has been taken so loosely that now when you text or Twitter, it's got its own abbreviation, OMG. You ever get a text this morning, what did they say? BTW, what does that mean? By the way. Hey, Gary, you text too much. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole set of abbreviations like that, and this one stands for, oh my God. And people just carelessly and sometimes casually, I'm not judging, I'm just on average, by the odds are, they're going to be doing this. I said I wouldn't talk so much. I better hurry up and quit talking. By the way, when I started this, my initial cut was 50 songs. Okay. <laughs> I, I, my final cut was a whole lot less than that. But, so trust me. 
Jesus. Jesus and Jesus Christ are the two names that are most commonly used. And we've all heard it. We've all seen it in movies and in television, sometimes to the extent that we're almost desensitized to it, but they've turned those two names of Jesus into swear words. So the problem hasn't gone away, even though the stoning has gone away. All right, enough of that. That's why, this is where I started with this. I was reading the Bible uh, on my second time through for this year. I, I got to Leviticus and I read that passage that that'll preach or be a sermon and song. So this morning, what I want us to do is What's in a name? Three parts. The names of God, the names of Jesus, and what God calls us. And so to begin, let's sing two songs, one about each name. His name is wonderful, the name of Jesus. His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. The rock of all ages, Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, Lord, and adore Him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. prayer, we're going to sing the name of God. And, uh, when you sing this song, it's not super familiar, but however, it's one of my wife's favorite songs, so if you don't know it, listen to her. <laughs> <laughs> She'll lead you down the right path musically. Mm -hmm. But when you sing this song, when you listen to the words, uh, there was no other song I could lead the prayer after. You'll understand what I mean. So that I don't worry about trying to turn it on or off. Is it too loud when I leave the microphone on when I'm singing? Is that bothering anybody? Okay. Speak the name of God so solemnly. Speak the name of God in prayer. In a world so full of profanity. Speak the name of God with care. Now young the God of El Shaddai, the God of the mountain, Lord of hosts and righteous Father, and glorify the great I am, Holy God. El, El Yon, the God of Israel, El Shaddai, the God of the mountain, Lord of hosts and righteous Father, we glorify the great I am. Speak the name of God, so solemnly speak the name of God in prayer. In a world so full of profanity, speak the name of God with care. Speak the name of God with care. Whisper the name of God. Father in heaven, we indeed come unto you at this time recognizing that you are a God. And we humbly, Father, recognize your name and that you are the creator of this world and the sustainer of life herein. And that you've given us, promise, Father, the promise of an eternal life with you. Father, we thank you for being yourself, for being you, and for being our Father. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. We thank Father, do not have the words to truly recognize 
how valuable you are and should be in our lives. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us as we go through this hour and that we recognize and give honor and glory to your name as we study and sing our songs of praises unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's look first at some of the names of God. Actually, two. There's a whole bunch to choose from. They're all from the Old Testament. Uh, it's not the same two that you catch in that song, El Shaddai, El Elyon. Those are some of the Hebrew names for God. And the first one I want us to look at is El Shaddai. Uh, Ryan has actually come across this name and Paul told us about it in our study of Judges. This means the Lord God Almighty, or most of the times it's just God Almighty when you see it in your translations. It's only used seven times. But it talks about the power of God. We serve a powerful God. He's got the power to do anything and everything that we need to get through this life. And so when we think about God as the Almighty, in Genesis 17, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Only an almighty God can make a unilateral covenant between himself and us as humans. He has the power to carry it out. He has the power to do everything that he promised Abraham, Abram in this case, and everything that he's promised to do for us. God Almighty. And so let's sing, Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty word. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty. Who reigns forevermore. I like that part of this verse. Who was and is and is to come. The God Almighty is eternal. Another song, similar idea. What a mighty God we serve. Or isn't that the case? Oh, what a mighty God we serve! What a mighty God we serve! Angels bow before Him, heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve! heard this one. It's hard for us to pronounce. It's Yahweh. That is mostly translated Lord or Jehovah. You see how many times it shows up just in the Old Testament? This is far and away the most common name that God is called by or that God calls himself. Jehovah. The mighty God, the almighty God is also our Jehovah. He is Lord. In Genesis 2, verse 4 is the first time it shows up. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord, <laughs> Jehovah God, made the earth and the heavens. So God was there at creation. And then when God was talking to Moses uh, around the time of the burning bush, he said, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them? We read the passage about Abraham back in Genesis 17. God says, I'm God Almighty. I'll make a covenant with you. He said the same thing to Isaac and Jacob. But he didn't use this name, his knowledge name, the name he's known by, Jehovah. But we know God as Jehovah. We know him by all of his names. And just picking these two, hopefully we can, we can get a little insight into who God is and how God wants to relate to us and care for us. 
And so let's sing hallelujah, praise Jehovah. We'll sing the chorus at the end. <coughs> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim, all his hosts together praise him, join in moon and stars on high. Praise him, Lord, he has about the scriptures that we're going to look at relating to this. 
and get your heart and your mind ready to share together in the Lord's Supper. When we do that, Mark, will you help me? You sit on the end there. Lamb of God, in John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist is speaking. And it says that the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Lambs, and goats, and bulls, and calves were used as sacrificial animals throughout the Old Testament, throughout the entire Mosaic period. And so, taking away the sin of the world, there's some sort of sacrifice tied to being the Lamb of God. And it's interesting that John is the very first one, John the Baptist, the very first one to identify Jesus as the Lamb of God. They both came from miraculous birth, they were cousins, they knew each other. And John said, truly, this is the Lamb of God. Paul expanded on that, day, on that idea in 1 Corinthians 5, where he said, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. Now Paul's making a different set of points, but just look at what he says here, and it stands on its own. The Passover feast, for seven days, they could eat nothing leavened. And Paul's saying, get rid of the old leaven, because we're really unleavened, because we have a Passover lamb, the Lamb of God, and he's been sacrificed. Now this isn't just a sacrifice of giving something up. Jesus' sacrifice as the Lamb of God was a blood offering to satisfy God's desire for justice and at the same time make a way for God's desire to give mercy. And when someone dies, it's a sorrowful situation. And thinking about the Lamb of God, let's think also about what Isaiah said in chapter 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, one acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. He was a perfect lamb, the lamb of God. But he had to become the man of sorrows because of the condition of mankind. Let's sing Hallelujah, what a Savior, and then we'll share the Lord's Supper together. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a
Father, we thank you so much that you are a just God and a merciful God. We thank you, Lord, for providing the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb, your own Son. And thank you, Lord, for his willingness to die on that cross so that we might live. His body was hung there, Lord. That sacrifice that offered up to you in its perfection a satisfaction for all of the sins of the world. And as we remember that body, let us remember it as the perfect lamb that it truly was. In Jesus' name. Father, again, we come to you and acknowledge that, as with any sacrifice, the blood was shed. And we thank you for that blood and its cleansing power that provides a transfusion into our souls to give us the righteousness of your Son. We want to offer ourselves, Father, as sacrificial lambs, giving our lives in service to you as we follow the example of Jesus Christ and his shed. Bless this cup as we share it together. In Jesus' name. to give back to the Lord part of what he has blessed us with. So as we think about our blessings, let's be generous with our gifts. Let's pray. Again, Father, we thank you not just for the gift of your Son, but for the gift of everything that we have in our lives. And Lord, help us to remember that you love cheerful givers. And whether it's large or small, Lord, doesn't matter. Just help us to remember that you gave and we give back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last, 
he will stand upon the earth. Job went through a lot of bad things, not the least of which was three of the most uncomforting friends I've ever read about. But he finally turned himself back over to God. I know my Redeemer lives. And so he hinted at the coming of Christ, the last, in the last days, what Hebrews said. In the last days, God spoke to us through his Son, and he stood on this earth. And he's coming back to take us home with him. That's what redeemers do. If you want to do this in your own personal study sometime, look in the Old Testament of the Law of Moses about the concept of the kinsman redeemer. We'll give you another set of perspectives on Jesus as our redeemer. Another one in Galatians, Paul says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And I put this one in there so that we really understand that when Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, this is the Redeemer. Christ has redeemed us. Nobody else could have done it. There is a Redeemer. And ladies, this song in each verse begins with a tenor soprano duet. I'm going to start you. Ladies, stay on your part. I'm going to switch to the tenor. <coughs> Redeemer lives, I 
do his redeemer would stand. We know that same redeemer is coming back soon and very soon. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Say hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the king. No more crying there, we are going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. No more dying there. But we are going to see the king. Hallelujah. No more dying there. But we are going to see the king. Say hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. And what a glorious thing to look forward to. Alright, that's some of the names of God, a couple of the names of Jesus. Let's look for a few minutes at what God calls us. We all have our given names. I'm Kenneth Wayne Davidson Jr. These give us a legal identifier. And that's the way we make introductions. Hi, I'm Ken Davidson. What's your name? Mark McCormick. Glad to meet you, Mark. Have you ever done that? We've all done that. That's the simple part. And yes, God knows that as one of our names. But there's a problem with labels from the world. Our past. Oh, why can't you be more like your brother, sister, cousin, aunt, or whatever? You'll never amount to anything. Can't you study? Are you stupid? We've heard hurtful things in our past, some of us have. Other people, those around us. Oh, he's not any good. Why'd he get that promotion? Who does she think she is, anyway? She's useless. There were any things like they were said they oh, hope. We all have. We've heard they hurt. Their names. The worst one, perhaps, is the accuser. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. You're not good enough. You've done too many bad things for God to save you. God doesn't really love you. What are you trying to do this? Who do you think you are to serve God? These things go on in their heads. They're not from us. They're not from God. They're from the accuser. And sometimes the harshest names of all come from our mirror. Now, I'm old. I'm fat. I'm worthless. I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. I'm lost. Those are the names we're bombarded with all the time. But there's another story. And that story is what God calls us. And before we sing, I want us to look at four verses to see things that God calls us. First, the Thessalonians. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. We are loved. God calls us chosen. Those are names you can hang on to. Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, new has come. God calls us a new creation. God, in addition to all of his other names, is the God of do-overs. He can make us new. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If we're God's workmanship, we need to recognize God don't make no joke. Bad grammar, good point. His workmanship. And because he has given us things to do, Paul says to the Corinthians, for we are God's fellow workers. What a name. We get to work side by side with God. 
You've heard this in that example before, I'm sure, but the only hands God hands has in this life are our hands. The only feet that God has in this life are our feet. The only voices that God has to speak for Him in this world are our voices. We are God's fellow workers. But in addition to these four, I want to look at two more. The first one is we are called His temple. The temple was a big deal to the Jews. By last count, I think, before Jesus got here, they were on their third temple. There was Solomon's temple after the um, captivity and then Herod's temple. We don't have a temple anymore, or do we? Again, to the Corinthians, Paul says, or Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. God doesn't say glorify your God when you get your body in shape. He doesn't say glorify God for your body because your body's in shape. He says glorify your God because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have a temple. And I want to encourage you as we sing these next two songs that whenever you sing them ever again in your entire life, I want you to remember this verse that we collectively and individually are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And truly, the Lord is in His temple. The glory of the Lord came down into the tabernacle. They could see it. God says, I put my Holy Spirit in my temple today. That you Let's remember, the Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before Him. Keep silent. Keep silent. Keep silent.
okay? His spirit's trying to line up with you. I'm here. I'm trying to help him or her line up with you. This is one of your children. Isn't that a powerful image? Not only does the Holy Spirit help us when we pray, Paul says that in about 10 verses, but he bears witness to God with our spirit that we are God's children. Look at the benefits. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Have you ever inherited anything? We know what a will is. We know what trusts are. You know what? Jesus' Father owns it all. That's a big inheritance. Heaven is a grand and glorious inheritance that's already prepared for those of us who are God's children. <clears throat> Now, there are some songs that talk about being God's children. But in the spirit of what I'm trying to do and, and help us to see what God calls us, I want us to sing the family of God, or God's family. I'm sorry, there's, there's another song with that other name. But, but this one really speaks to the idea that together, <clears throat> when God is our father and Jesus is our older brother, we make up God's family. We're part of the family that's been born again. It's not all that trapped up to be. It's a hopeless pursuit. The only true hope in this world is through Jesus Christ and being given the names that God gives us. And we can share that hope with the world around us. But what God calls us finally gives us purpose. It gives us true meaning in life. And 
position of being hopeless other than materialistic pursuits, the world does not really have a purpose suited to God's will. Only those who have come to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, have the true purpose and the true identity and the lasting hope of God. And so as we go out of here today, through this week, and throughout our lives, I want us to sing one last song. This is what I want us to do. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So shut up the world and listen to God is my point. Do what he says. And so what I want us to take with us is the name of Jesus. <laughs> Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you, take it then where you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, oh father and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. opportunities come to take those opportunities and reach out to others to serve them to help them but also to spread your gospel the good news that Jesus is our king we thank you so much for loving us go with us now let us always remember and keep close to us that we are your children and how proud we are of that name in Jesus name amen, amen.